Hello, I'm MC Toon. Recently, Flatzoid, Flatzoid hosted a Glober uh, named Andrew Johnston, and Andrew had a fantastic presentation where he, he used a survey that completed in 1901 called the Transcontinental Triangulation and the American Arc of the Parallel. It's a 900-page publication that has an immense amount of data in it, including a lot of details on the actual methods that they used, has pictures of the, the instruments they use. Anyway, I'll get right to it. He, he showed how the measured triangles on in the survey, and there's hundreds of them, how they, how they um, confirm that the Earth has a particular shape. And I will leave it to Andrew to explain all of it. So I'm presenting uh, about uh, geodetic surveying and the evidence it has for the spherical Earth, and that is uh, using uh, the um, measurement of spherical excess as evidence. Uh, I've got three main arguments. One, that there's, there is empirical measurement of spherical excess uh, in geodetic surveying. Uh, I will show analysis that refutes the flat Earth arguments, which I've heard about geodetic surveying, uh, that being that the... Uh, Surveyors actually measure a flat Earth and then add in the curve to make it look like uh, it's a globe. And lastly, that uh, the predictions that they make in their survey using the assumption of curve match real world measurements. OK, my main reference will be the transcontinental triangulation and the American arc of the parallel by the uh, US Coast and Geodetic Survey. Uh, this was, as the name suggests, highlighted there in red, a uh, geodetic survey across the full width of the North American continent. Uh, roughly following the 39 north latitude line. The pencil field work was done between 1872 and 1898, and the book, The Results, was published in 1901. Now, I'm going to put this in the context uh, of the knowledge of the shape of the Earth at the time, uh, and we'll just go through a very brief history of that, which a lot of you will probably already know, but we'll run through it. Um, the spherical shape of the Earth was uh, surmised by the Greeks since at least the 5th century BC, and we're all probably you know, well familiar with the Eratosthenes and his sticks and shadows. Uh, around 240 BC. About 150 years later, another Greek called Posidinius uh, did something similar using two locations in Greece, um, using the star Canopus. And his northern location in Greece, uh, Canopus barely rises above the southern horizon, and at his southern location, it reaches a higher altitude in the sky at night. And so, uh, just like Eratosthenes, he had deduced his latitude distance and compared it to the distance over the ground to estimate the circumference of the Earth. Um, just a side note, um, you might think, well, why didn't he use Polaris to uh, determine his latitude distance like we might do today? Well, 2,000 years ago, Polaris wasn't the pole star. The pole star does move, and in fact, at the time, there were no bright stars uh, within about eight degrees of the northern celestial pole. So he didn't have a pole star like we do today. Uh, the globe model, of course, has an explanation for the precession of the equinoxes. I haven't heard anything from the flat Earth side about this one, but that's just a side note. Now, moving on quite a bit, we're probably all familiar with Al Biruni, who in about 1000 AD used horizon dip to measure, uh, measure the uh, circumference of the Earth, came up with a similar number. Um, in about the 1600s, with the um, scientific revolution, uh, in telescopes and lenses were invented, and that led to better, more accurate measurements of the sky and of the ground. In uh, 1670, Picard was probably the first modern um, uh, accurate survey a geodetic survey, uh, and he uh, measured a degree of the meridian arc around Paris and calculated the radius, which these days we only disagree by about half a percent of the radius of the Earth to what he got to. So he got pretty close. Um, let's see. Newton in 1689 theorized the Earth would actually be flattened at the poles due to rotation, and this was confirmed by French surveying expeditions to South America and Finland in the 1730s. And so by the time of the transcontinental triangulation, spheroidal models were at a point of only differing from current models uh, by about 100 metres of radius. As we, I've just plotted here some uh, historic um, spheroids uh, over time. And you can see by about the late 1800s, uh, we haven't really uh, changed our estimate of the size of the Earth by very much. We're in pretty strong agreement since then about the, sh the shape of the Earth. And... Um, Lastly, the point of all, all what I've just provided to you is that um, the shape of the Earth was well known by the late 18th century, sorry, the late 19th century, uh, when the transcontinental triangulation was done. And they weren't setting out to prove the shape of the Earth, but rather they were surveying to provide a framework for accurate mapping of the entire United States. 
So now to triangulation survey. The purpose is establish, of surveying is to establish precise locations of points within an area. With triangulation survey, it is done by measuring an angle from two known locations on our diagram, A and B, the baseline, uh, to a third location and using trigonometry determined to determine the position of the third. And furthermore, the precisely measured baseline uh, provides a starting point for the distance calculations. Uh, this method is well suited, sorry, that one's a bit big, a bit better. This method is well suited to large, covering large areas with a modest amount of effort using long chains of triangles. And let's make that uh, bigger again. That's a bit big and not, not a great picture, but using long chains of triangles uh, to survey your territory. Okay, now the transcontinental triangulation itself covered the about 4,000 kilometres between Cape May, New Jersey, which is on the east coast of America, uh, to Point Arena, California on the west. Across the entire country, there were 308 survey points from which they uh, formed 743 uh, surveying triangles. And it was broken up into 10 small base nets. These are the yellow circles in my diagram here, small areas of triangles, which were joined by nine long chains of triangles and a few uh, further to short chains uh, to reach the ocean at both uh, both coastlines. Now, the, what I was talking about being the base nets were relatively small areas uh, of survey. This one is one which is about 20, sorry, about 40 kilometres by 60 kilometres with, a, with uh, a reasonably high density of survey stations. And these base nets were uh, connected together by the long chains of triangles uh, so this is a chain of triangles joining two base nets on the left and the right of the screen. Uh, this one's about 450 kilometres long. So within the small base nets, you have a very high accuracy. And within the uh, chains joining those base nets, you've got a little bit less accuracy, but you cover a lot of ground relatively quickly. So at each of these survey stations across the entire network, uh, then we have some strapping young um, men of the uh, Victorian era. They would set up a, um, uh, a theodolite and measure the angles separating the surrounding stations uh, multiple times and average those readings. Uh, for example, here in the base station I'm using, the Linstead point, which is at the center of the base station, there are seven surrounding stations. So they measure the angles between those seven stations multiple times and uh, average them. Um, these stations commonly, in some areas, they are up on hilltops, fairly spectacular areas. Uh, so they can get a good view of the stations around them. And in the lower lying areas, uh, they would set up um, observing towers. Uh, in this case, this tower, um, the platform about halfway up there is about 30 metres off the ground. The target at the top, when other stations are viewing back to this one, is about 80 metres off the ground. It's the sort of effort they would go to. Uh, now, it's important to, to stress that when they're measuring these angles, they are just measuring the horizontal angle, or in this diagram, what's called the azimuth angle. Uh, between targets. The vertical differences are irrelevant between targets. It doesn't matter if one target is up on the top of a hill, the other one's down below them in a valley. Uh, it is just the horizontal component of the separation that matters. Now, this importantly means that refraction is not a factor in these measurements. Now, given that refraction essentially only happens in the vertical direction, and this is actually one of the reasons why I like using spherical excess as one. It's pretty much my favourite globe evidence. Um, because often in these debates, refraction become, can become a bit of a distraction, can become a source of confusion, you know, black swan, things like that. We all argue about refraction. So with spherical excess in geodetic surveying, we're only dealing with azimuth angles. So we don't even need to consider refraction as a factor in those measurements. Okay, so at each, at each of the base nets, they also have one line which they meticulously measured the actual length across the ground. In the base net I'm showing here, I've uh, highlighted that with a red line down in the bottom uh, bottom right of it. Uh, now, the measurement for each of these base stations took quite a bit of effort. Um, they first had to uh, clear a path, a direct path between those two locations. A fair bit of effort there. Uh, and then using measuring rods, uh, they would uh, measure that distance. This one, uh, actually for the um, base net that I've just showed you, they used a set of four measuring rods uh, some precisely measured uh, rods of about uh, nominally two metres long each. Uh, these rods have been compared to national standards, so they knew the exact length of these rods right down to fractions of a millimetre. Uh, and throughout the surveying process, they would actually record temperatures uh, when they were doing the measurements so they could account for the thermal expansion of the rods. Okay, now 
And here we have a bit of an example, uh, a bit of a painting at the, at the time of them actually uh, using the rods, just end over end, adding one to the other and meticulously measuring the length of that baseline. Um, the Kent Island baseline, the one I've just been showing, is about eight and a half kilometres long. It took them over a month to measure and they, uh, they calculated the length down to the tenth of a millimetre over an eight and a half kilometre length. Uh, the longest baseline in the whole survey was actually over 17 kilometres, so about the same sort of size in general general terms, and it took two months to measure that baseline, and some of them actually, they measured forwards and reverse in both directions twice, so they actually measured them four times uh, to make sure they had them accurately measured. From all this effort uh, that it took to do this, you can understand why that simply measuring your way across the country to determine uh, where you're located uh, is a phenomenally impractical and uh, slow method to do things and that's why triangulation survey is used where you can jump large distance just with optical measurements okay so on to what they uh, what part of the survey that i think is important and that is spherical excess uh, so once you've got your baselines measured your angles are measured uh, we, we come to solving of the triangles to join all those things together and this is where it's spherical ex excess turns up so now Hopefully most of you are aware, the internal angles of a normal triangle uh, sum to 180 degrees. Um, but as you may also be aware, triangles can also be formed on the surface of a sphere. These are known, obviously, as spherical triangles. Their internal angles always add up to more than 180 degrees. And as they increase in size and take up more of the surface of the sphere, the angles can add up to as much as 540 degrees. And the amount that they add up to over 180 degrees is known as the spherical excess. Uh, and in practice, we won't be dealing with huge amounts of spherical excess. We're dealing with fractions of a degree uh, in the case of this survey. So now I'll move on. Uh, now, the globe claim about spherical excess is often put simply as triangles are surveyed and found to have spherical excess. Well, unfortunately, the reality of surveying is it's not quite so simple out here in the real world. So, again, looking at this Kent Island base net that I'm going to use as an example, um, the, we'll look at the first tri this triangle that I've highlighted between Kent Island South, Kent Island North and Taylor. Okay, now these are the measurements as published in the publication. Now, the thing I need to you to look at is the green box um, yeah, over here in the top left. Um, actually, yes, my cursor is showing, so I can show you. Uh, well, that didn't work. Hang on a moment. There we go. I got my highlight again. So we can look over here in the green box here. Um, and we can see that the angles of the Kent Island Triangle, the one I was talking about here, add up to 180 degrees, zero arc minutes, and 1.29 arc seconds. Um, so we see that it does indeed add up to slightly greater than 180 degrees. Um, but if we look down the page, we see, for example, triangle two, triangle three, and triangle five um, add up to a little bit less than 180 degrees, okay, which is a little bit of a problem. So you might think that this uh, just makes the measurements a little bit inconclusive, a bit of margin of error, um, maybe, um, but there is actually a big problem if you think these angles are accurate because planar triangles, flat normal triangles, sum to 180 degrees, Spherical triangles always sum to greater than 80 degrees. So how can we have triangles that ha add to less than 180 degrees? Now, I'll get to this explanation in a moment, but we're going to shift to somewhere else where this isn't quite so much of a problem. So just briefly before we go, if we look over here on the right of the screen, you'll see the distance of the sides of these triangles. It's in metres. So if we look at this first section, we've got 8, 13 and 11 kilometres. So there's a modestly sized triangles in terms of geodetic surveying. But if we move over to, there we go. So I'm now showing uh, similar things for the Salt Lake area. So Salt Lake, Utah, uh, we're dealing, we're getting to the edge of the Rocky Mountains here. Uh, and if we look at the right-hand side here, we can see the triangles on this side have sides here of up to 185 kilometers. So they are significantly larger in this case. Um, okay, I can see my cursor highlights not coming through. It doesn't matter, I shall plow on. Okay, so um, so now looking at the Salt Lake Base Net Triangles with these big triangles, if we look at the red boxes on the left, I've highlighted again uh, with little red boxes there, we can see that they have spherical excesses from these measurements of 6, 
13, 33, 11, uh, and 35 arc seconds. None of them have a deficit. We all have an excess of angles in those triangles. Uh, so we find that once the triangles become large enough, we have clear empirical measurements of spherical excess. And that is my first argument. So now moving on to the explanation, uh, what is going on with the Kent Iron Island triangles? Uh, the problem is that there's no such thing as a perfect measurement. Uh, for these smaller triangles, the amount of excess is fairly small and it could be hidden by the errors in the angle measurements. But there's a way to reduce that er error. It's called observation adjustment, and it's a common process in many types of surveying. Yes, geodetic and even planar surveying does this to uh, error correct, basically. So, for example, say we have measured ang four lines from locations, and they're all pointing to a point at the top of this picture, uh, to a point we're trying to measure called point P. But if we zoom in to where those, those lines are all uh, converging, we find that they actually don't converge. Because of small errors in the measurements, when we plot them out, they're not converging. So what do we do? We have six different locations where these converge. Where is point P? Is it one of those? No, we don't really know. So what we do is we find an average, some sort of average of those locations, and that's that cross in the middle of the screen, and then we adjust those angles that we've measured so that all our four lines actually converge at the same point. Now, we still don't know the actual location of P, but this is statistically what is known as our most probable location. From all the data we've got, this is the best we can determine and say this is where point P is. So this is what's done in uh, geodetic surveying to um, correct for errors as such. Now, they don't do it one point at a time and then move on to another point because that will actually... Uh, allow for propagation of error. They actually look at the entire network or an entire group of triangles and solve the whole lot at once. Now, uh, these days, uh, you would quite easily take all your data from your observations and have a computer uh, do the calculation, and it would probably do it quicker than Don Pettit would go back to the moon. Uh, but mm -hmm. in the 19th century, it all had to be done by hand. Uh, the transcontinental triangulation used a method from this book, The Treatise of the Adjustment of Observations uh, in 1884, which itself is based on a mathematical process called the least, least squares regression analysis. Needless to say, the method is quite involved, but it is just a mathematical way of averaging all your observations and minimizing the total amount of error across your entire network. Now, importantly, I do have to mention that these uh, corrections do not actually add any angles. They just shift them around. So looking here at the uh, angles that were measured at the Kent Island North Base, in the red, we can see the angle difference between the different uh, stations around them that they measured. In the orange box, we can see the corrections that were made to these due to this statistical process. And in the blue box, we see what the angles got adjusted to. And if you look at the orange box, if you add up all those various small pluses and minus, they add to zero. So they're not actually adding any angle to the, which might be an accusation of them. Uh, they are just shifting those observations uh, around ever so slightly. Okay, uh, moving on. So if we now look at, back at the Kent Island Triangles, which is the screen I had earlier on, we can see that in the red box down the middle of the screen, these are the corrections that are made to each of the angles, each of the triangles. And we can see we have a little minus one arc second. We will have plus 0.6 of an arc second, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the... The triangles which we had trouble with before being, two, I think it was two, four, and five, uh, no, two, three, and five, they have had some corrections made. And so in the blue, we now see that every single one of these triangles now has a very small amount of excess in it. Uh, so everything's good now from now on. And if we go back to the Salt Lake triangles, which were the really big ones before, which already had excess, which is these small red boxes, we find in the big red boxes, we have the adjustments that are made to them, again, around about up, up a, uh, plus or minus one arc second or so to each of those. So there's still only very small adjustments. And highlighted in the blue, we have their um, corrected angles and the amount of uh, spherical excess. And we still find that we have quite a significant large amount of spherical excess, 7, 14, 31 arc seconds of excess. So now that we've done the corrections to the angles, we can uh, calculate the distance between the points and therefore give locations for all those surveying points uh, using trigonometry. Okay, uh, now moving on to my second argument, I've often heard that, you know, I've often heard the claim by flat earthers and others that geodetic surveyors measure flat and add curve. 
Well, I've just shown you in those, uh, those observations just before that they don't actually measure flat. If the triangles are big enough, they're not measured flat. They do have curve. But now I'll show that also, that even with these corrections, there's not really any evidence to say that they add curve. Now, just as with planar triangles, if we know some of the properties of a spherical triangle, we can solve for the rest of the properties of the triangle. And that includes the radius of curvature that the triangle is taken from. Now, MC Toon created this lovely spreadsheet using some of the data from the triangles in the survey. Uh, he's got data there for 43 of the triangles in the survey and was able to put them through the equations and calculate the radius of curvature for all 129 triangle sides separately, because you can do this for each side of the triangle separately. And if we look at the results of that, um, I've highlighted there in boxes down to one to 10. These are, for example, next to one, that is the three sides of triangle number one in the spreadsheet. And below it is the three sides of triangle two, three sides of triangle three, etc. So we can see with triangle one, within the triangle, the three sides all come up to a radius value. This is in meters. Um, that is pretty consistent with each other. If we look at uh, triangle two, the radius values here for each three sides of the triangle, pretty much the same value, the same for uh, triangle three. But between each of those three triangles, and I've, I've averaged each triangle here on the right in the blue, you can see that the values do actually differ by a little bit. And you can sort of expect some of that uh, due to errors of measurement, errors of calculations. So they're doing this stuff by hand. However, if we plot these values, uh, the blue values here, uh, for all 43 triangles, and I've just laid them out here in numerical, in numerical increasing order, we see that uh, there's a spread of values. Uh, most of the values are fairly close to an average value across the middle of the graph here, but we see that there are some that are a couple of percent below that value, and over at the right side, we see some that are a couple of percent and up to, I think it's about 5% above for that. And that's only 43 of the triangles, but it is indicative that... Um, uh, they do vary in their radius value. Now, incidentally, the black line I've put is not the average of those values. The black line is actually the expected radius value based on the WGS84 spheroid. So you can see that their calculations that they got uh, on average seem to compare very favorably with what we would expect today with our knowledge of the shape of the Earth. Um, so the conclusion of this being a spread of values and not all sitting nicely about an average, is if the surveyors actually were taking flat measurements of flat triangles and adding in the amount of spherical excess they are told to expect from a spherical Earth, they did a bit of a sloppy job of it. Because uh, if they had actually done this as a backwards calculation, we should see this, this uh, radius value vary by a, ho a whole lot less. It should pretty much be very consistent, and it's not. Now, I did a second analysis of some of these triangles uh, to, that showed a very similar thing. Uh, one of the other properties of a spherical triangle is that the amount of excess is linearly proportional to its size. The bigger it gets, the more, the greater the amount of uh, spherical excess. So I took uh, 15 triangles, five from the Kent Island uh, area, which was in Maryland on the east coast, five from Salina area in Kansas, which is right in the middle of the country, and five from the Salt Lake area, which is in the Rockies, where you've got big triangles, you've got mountainous terrain, so it might be a little bit... It, uh, different conditions there and compared their excess to the area. So on the x-axis of this graph, we have the area of the 15 triangles that uh, I chose, not quite randomly, but a selection. Uh, and on the, on the y-axis, we see the amount of excess in arc seconds that each of those triangles uh, exhibits. And as you can see, there is something of a linear relationship going on there. You might think, well, that's, that's what we expect. That's great. Uh, but if we actually look a little bit closer with it and we look at the rate of excess uh, per, for, per area, uh, we find that maybe not for the large triangles, but again, on the left side, we see for the, some of these small triangles, there's a lot of variation in the rate of excess. The, so that is, that is the rate, the amount of excess per area of triangle. And we see that there's a lot of variation. Uh, so again... Um, if the surveyors had actually taken flat measurements and back calculated and add in the expected amount of excess, this graph shouldn't show nearly as much variation. The numbers should uh, be a lot more consistent. Incidentally, based on WGS84, I haven't put the line in, but the expected value rate of excess is around about 196 uh, based on current models. So their numbers uh, were close to current values, but there's a bit of variation around it. And so that's my second argument that if you look at the data, you see that there's no evidence that they back-calculated expected values into it. 
Okay. Uh, and my last of my main arguments is some analysis that the survey themselves did to report on the accuracy of the work. It's called baseline accord. Okay, not that type of base accord. Um, <laughs> thank you, Keith. Thank you. Sorry, flat forward. Thank you for the laugh there. Um, I knew you'd enjoy the car. So I'll explain what baseline accord is. So remembering that the survey was a, a series of connected base nets, that's the yellow circles, and each base net had just one meticulously measured baseline. So there's only 10 actual on the ground measurements of length made across the entire 4,000 kilometres. The baseline accord is to see how well the measured length of one of these baselines maxillate, maxim, sorry, uh, uh, matches the calculated length uh, of that baseline as determined by traversing across the country from the neighbouring baseline, okay? So I'll, I'll explain a bit more what I mean by that. So um, here is the easternmost triangle. Actually, I'll go back and show it. So we're dealing with this here on the east coast between the, the uh, Kent Island in Maryland and St Albans, uh, uh, West Virginia, I think, uh, base net. So we're dealing with this area on, on the close to the east coast. So... Um, over here, we on the right in orange, we have the Kent Island base net, and over on the left, we have the St Albans base net, and in between, we have this huge connected series of triangles. Now, this spans about 450 kilometres between the left and the right of the screen. So if you consider the hypothetical situation of the surveyors starting over here at the Kent Island base net and measuring this very small thick line here, which is about eight and a half kilometres long, and then they traverse all the way across the country to the west here, over 450 kilometres, uh, and all they're doing is taking angle measurements along the way. They're not doing any measurement of the length of the ground anywhere at all. And they get over here to St Albans, and I'm going to zoom in on the St Albans area, and they get to this point where they've surveyed all these except for these last two, which I've, I've circled in orange here. So they stop at this point, and using... Uh, and using the angles that they've measured along the way and that one baseline that was of eight and a half kilometres that was measured 450 kilometres away, they calculate how far apart these two locations are or how far apart they think they are based on their surveying. They do the statistical corrections and they apply the trigonometry and they come up with an answer. And in this case, they would come up with an answer of 3,870.4126 metres for the separation of those two locations, okay? Uh, meanwhile, whilst they've been coming across the country doing their angle measurements, they've had another crew out actually physically measuring the distance between two those, those two locations, and that crew come back to them and they report that, we, that they reckon that the distance that's actually measured is 3,870.4028 metres uh, for that length. So if it's not clear, after the survey has traversed 450 kilometres, just taking angle measurements, their calculation of the separation of those two locations was within one centimetre of the actual measured length, which is pretty amazing. So now this shows that their angle measuring, uh, their correction techniques and their trigonometry were really, really accurate. But I, I hear you, how is this evidence for a spherical Earth? Couldn't this all just be trigonometry being done on a flat plane matching the distances on a flat plane? Well, no. The reason being that the methods used to solve the triangles uh, to get themselves across the country use spherical trigonometry, not planar trigonometry, uh, which has in, in it an assumption of the radius of the Earth into the process. Uh, so that doesn't mean... Sorry. So doesn't that mean they assume the radius to determine the radius? Well, no, that's also not true. Um, in the example uh, here that I've just shown you, the calculated length of the St Albans baseline here on the left of the picture was essentially a prediction made from being 450 kilometres away. The fact that their prediction was based on an assumed radius, as they came across, uh, and the geometry of, of a spherical surface using spherical trigonometry and got such an accurate answer is pretty strong evidence that the surface they actually traversed across is actually spherical. It's kind of like the difference of whether they use a chord length or an arc length to calculate uh, their movement across the country of that 450 kilometres. They made their predictions based on using arc length, assuming it was an arc length, and got within a centimetre of this distance, 450 kilometres away. So this 
pretty strong evidence again that the distances across the surface of the Earth really are arc lengths. And that's my third point. So that's my three main points. Quick summary. Empirical measurements of spherical excess. So here in the Salt Lake Base Net, this is a picture I showed you earlier on, we can see in orange and then in the smaller red squares, we, we even before doing corrections for uh, margin of error, uh, we see that we do have um, excess angle in those triangles. Secondly, uh, some analysis that refutes the measure flat and add curve uh, argument, and that was the, uh, uh, sorry, just get, get myself, in the right place again, showing uh, on the left, showing variation in the curvature, the effective radius of those triangles. They were not all consistent. And on the right, we showed variation in the rate of excess in those triangles. Again, if they'd been uh, calculated back, those the, the, the plot of these data should be much uh, closer together. Okay. And lastly, the accuracy of their spherical predictions, which I've just shown a second ago, uh, that using spherical based calculations for the distance across the chain of triangles they were able to make highly accurate predictions of the separation of, uh, of um, two surveying points that were hundreds of kilometres away from where they started. So uh, that concludes my main argument. Sorry, let's go on from that. Um, but I'm not finished yet. yet. Another thing. So if you somehow think that the... Uh, uh, sorry, if somehow after the evidence I've presented from the publication and the analysis that I've done, you still think that the people involved in the survey are some, somehow high, uh, still hiding the reality of the flat earth, then you need to realise that this is just one survey of quite a lot that were done. Triangulation surveys were commonplace for over about 250 years and really only since about the mid to late 20th century uh, have they fallen out of favour for different techniques. So over that 250 year period, and here are just a smattering of other surveys, which you'd also have to prove uh, are being lied about. Here is the principal triangulation of Britain done between 1791 and 1853. The Great Trigonometrical Survey of India between 1802 and 1871, which very famously uh, was the first uh, uh, determination of the height of Mount Everest, which was done in 1847. So is that wrong, um, is the question. Here is France's situation between 1818 and 1843. Flatsoid, if you look carefully, it's a bit hard to see. You might recognise this area of the world. This is Southern Africa, uh, including South Africa and Zimbabwe. Uh, that was their situation between 1883 and 1953 of the surveys that had been done over about a 50, 60 year period. We have Japan in the 50s in the post-war period. Uh, we have the sum total of all geodetic surveying in North America as at 1969. We have somewhere I like uh, Australia as at 1986. Uh, we have a more detailed view of the US as at 1983. And lastly, I don't have a date for this one, probably the 60s, maybe the 70s. We have the sum total of all geodetic surveying, horizontal control surveys done across the entire globe in around about by about the 1960s. Uh, that's a lot of surveying, and we have actually. If I just can I zoom in here? Yes, I can. Uh, we have a little bit of a uh, a uh, bonus here for flat earthers over here in the right hand corner. We can see that even parts of Antarctica had been surveyed by then. Uh, I'm not sure what. Whoops, wrong button. Not sure what you think about that. Okay, so I will just about finished here. So, question is, if this is actually all one massive con conspiracy. Um, and then if you consider all the people that are involved in all those centuries of surveying, then what, why is it that flat earthers cannot cite anyone that has come forward and even hinted that it was all one big elaborate ruse? That no one has said that they have seen the very, very simple fact that the angles that they helped measure and record do only indeed add up to 180 degrees. And why, can't, why don't we hear citations of anyone who's published their own independent surveying that proves that the official ones are wrong and just a lie? And, you know, no one is stopping you from going out there and doing your own surveying um, uh, and exposing this lie. So the question is, why don't we hear about these things? Is, is perhaps uh, geodetic surveying actually true? Okay, final thoughts. Now, I don't expect to change your mind here, and that's fine, but uh, I've been reading up about this thing, this, this subject. I thought I'd like to make a presentation and uh, present to you... Um, that some of the assertions that I hear from, from flat earthers about um, surveying and spherical excess 
uh, can, are refuted by the data in this publication uh, and also my analysis of the data. Um, that the survey is empirical measurement of spherical excess and thus curvature and its predictions based on assumption of curvature are in complete accord with the known shape of the Earth. So that's it. I'm done. I hope I didn't go on that much longer. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening to Eduardo.